So, hey, this is Pete Georgiakakis with EMS Leads Podcast, and today with me I have Dr. Alex Colgan, who is currently the EMS Fellow at the University of Iowa. He uh, is coming from the University of Washington, where he did medical school, as well as the University of Iowa residency, and we had a year of overlap in residency, and then I got to work with him as a fellow, and I've since worked with him as an attending and now in the fellowship, and so sounds like after residency and fellowship, he's headed back to Wyoming, because he in his own words, uh, owes the state a lot of money. And so we couldn't, couldn't rope him into staying, but um, we've been really fortunate to have him. So I wanted to bring him on today to uh, talk about a really exciting topic, which is refractory VFib. There is a lot of exciting potentials with not a lot of great proven information. So we just thought today we would talk a little bit about um, just some of the information that's out there, what different groups are doing, and just why this is such an important um, entity, because this is something that breaks a little bit of the mold of our typical uh, pre-hospital mantra, which is that there's not a lot of things we can't do in the field, especially with cardiac arrest. But when we get into the refractory VFib um, arena, we start to get into this question of, are there some things? Is there an argument to be made to get patients to the hospital? So um, welcome, Alex. And uh, let's kind of get started here. So. The first thing we wanted to kind of go through is what is the definition of refractory VFib? And so one of the issues is that there is not a standard definition. And so a Japanese study talks about it as being um, presentation of the hospital in VFib after at least one defibrillation. Um, in that study, they said that refractory VFib accounted for 24% of all patients and 4% of witness out of hospital cardiac arrest, which is not surprising if it's every patient that was shocked more than once. Another study said uh, refractory VFib is at least three defibrillation attempts and administration of 300 milligrams amiodarone. And in that context, they were talking more that you've essentially reached the end of your ACLS algorithm. You've shocked them three times in the meantime, given them epi and given them amiodarone, and now the algorithm ends and just tells you to go back to the beginning. And so um, Another place says it's persistent VFib despite already excellent high performance CPR and correctly performed defibrillation. So as you can tell, there's really no set, no set guideline, which explains why it's such a moving target and there's not set answers on what to do. And so um, a blog from NAEMSP words it better than I could and says one major issue to researching this in a meaningful way is that there doesn't seem to be a consensus definition of what refractory or persistent VFib is. Is it three shocks, five, seven, a predefined number of minutes? To date, there doesn't seem to even be a majority agreement as to how to define this. So obviously, this is very difficult. So I think I don't presume to make a definition, but I think the, the safest one is to say, you know, I, I think the one that's most reasonable in the sense of when you're talking to a pre hospital team of how to define this, it's probably. Um, when you've exhausted the ACLS algorithm. So you've shocked them, you've, shocked, you've done a pulse check, done epi, done amiodarone, and now it's time to determine more so in the field, what is our disposition? Do we continue this? Do we get moving to the hospital? And I think that's probably the point in time where, as we'll talk about, there seems to be a potential benefit. So does that sound reasonable? Sounds reasonable. Okay. So just kind of talking about arrests in general, um, out-of-hospital cardiac arrests account for about 350,000 deaths a year in North America. And they've found studies vary a bit, but the range is about 60 to 80% initially have a shockable rhythm. That's not to say when EMS arrives they do, but that's just to say when they went down, whenever that was, up to 80% of them had a shockable rhythm. And as we know in the evidence, uh, in the first three minutes of a cardiac arrest, 70 to 80% of VFib or v pulseless VTAC can be converted. And then that percentage decreases 10% for every minute afterwards, which is why we've done these huge public education um, campaigns for bystander CPR. You have AEDs everywhere because time really matters. We found that VFib arrests account for about 12.1 per 100,000 people. The CARES data, the National Cardiac Arrest Database in 2015, said that those with out of hospital cardiac arrest, but an initially shockable rhythm, that are shocked survive to discharge about 33% of the time and about 30% of them will have a good neurologic outcome, which is really what we care about. Um, 
So now when we talk about refractory V-fib, we find that that accounts for about four to five percent of our out-of-hospital cardiac arrests, which is about 0.5 per thousand, 100,000 people. So way less than just ventricular fibrillation. However, the mortality is 85 to 97 percent and the neuro intact survival at a month is about 5%. So the big takeaway here and why we're even spending the time tonight talking about this is we need earlier detection and better interventions for refractory VFib. So Dr. Kogan's gonna talk a little bit about what the causes are and really what refractory VFib is physiologically and then we'll get into some proposed treatments. So go ahead. Yeah, thanks Pete. So essentially the etiology of refractory VFib by far and away is coronary artery disease. It's essentially any disease process that's going to, uh, you know, impair coronary and myocardial perfusion. Um, coronary artery disease is about 42 to 84 percent cause of refractory VFib. Um, there have also been reports of aortic dissection and pulmonary embolus causing uh, refractory VFib. Um, this can also be caused by structural heart disease, um, even severe electrolyte derangements, anything that's going to impair uh, the electrical um, conductivity and create electrical instability in the cardiomyocytes. Um, so even, you know, acute and chronic renal patients can even have this. Um, they've also found some reentrant tachydysrhythmias have been associated uh, with refractory VFib, especially things like Brugada um, and WBW. Um, as far as the pathophysiology, it's actually very interesting, uh, the horrifying uh, kind of cause of what's going on. So there's some suggestion that a, sim uh, a sympathetic drive is kind of the main primary uh, culprit in these presentations. Uh, the overall state of the heart is one of electrical storm, hence the fibrillation and tachycardia. Um, it kind of ends up giving birth to this kind of mantra, beta blockers are good and adrenaline's bad. So the reason, the other reason we care about the pathophysiology, the pathophysiology of the sympathetic, um, excuse me, uh, the sympathetic drive is because the question becomes, are we just driving this electrical storm in this sympathetic drive? Um, or are we, you know, creating meaningful work on getting perfusion to the cardiomyocytes? Uh, this pathophysiology of this uh, electrical storm becomes shock resistant because uh, the circuits are just depolarizing and repolarizing at random throughout the heart. You have no coordinated effort from the SA node kind of all the way through the electrical system. So the goal then becomes kind of reorganizing that underlying rhythm uh, is your goal of therapy for this kind of electrical storm and ventricular fibrillation, uh, which is extremely difficult with a very upset heart, especially if there's ongoing ischemia and you're not able to treat the underlying disease. So then I'll kick it back to Pete and we'll talk a little more about kind of why we care about this. I kind of started talking about that, but there's a lot to go into here. Exactly. So the big thing here is, as Dr. Colgan said, the vast majority of these patients have coronary artery disease, which is to say they would likely benefit from PCI or some sort of intervention. But the disconnect is, again, you know, we're all EMS people. So we're thinking we're still sitting in the living room at their house. We're not in the, you know, we're not near a cath lab. And in some places, we might be 40 minutes away. And so the previous evidence has shown that, you know, the patients that are going to survive are often going to survive with ACLS care. And those that aren't, you know, we've talked about various termination criteria that are well derived and validated because we're trying to minimize futile transports. And so essentially, most patients, you know, what we're doing in the field, we can do in the ED. But here, because of its unique problem, there are a subset of patients with potential survivability with a good neurologic outcome that would be saved with some sort of extra circulatory intervention. So it behooves us to get patients to the hospital. This is a time where there are things in the hospital that we can do. So now the balance though, is we need to have a way to identify these patients that will benefit without overusing very limited and expensive resources. So we wanna use those resources in a very high value manner. So that's kind of why we care about it and why we thought it was worth talking about because these are patients that we should really be able to help survive. So what are some of the treatments for this? So number one, obviously, is the ACLS care, CPR and defibrillation. If you listen to our EMS updates podcast, we talk often about the number one thing that you need is high quality CPR. And as, as non-fond of ACLS as I am, the last update did really prioritize high quality compressions and, and define it very clearly. And so we're not going to go into it here, but the point is that um, increasing survival rates out of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest are due to improving the first three steps of the chain of survival. 
And those are recognizing the out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, activating 911, and starting CPR. So there was a great quote that said, after years of focus on airway before circulation, we've come to the understanding that we need to focus on circulation. Excellent BLS care in the form of high quality CPR and early defibrillation is the cornerstone of cardiac arrest care. And again, if you want more information with that, go to our previous podcast on updates of cardiac arrest care because it talks about multiple studies, including the OPAL study that showed that ALS care, which is defined as advanced airways, IV access, medications, do not improve outcomes compared to BLS care. So again, CPR and defibrillation. But as Dr. Colgan said, the problem is that you have these excitable myocardium that is now stuck in this electrical storm in this cascade. And so CPR helps with circulation, but it really introducing further electricity is really not what's gonna fix this. So what's another thing? He alluded to this as well. And so one of the ideas is this sympathetic blockade. Is there a way to stop the catecholamine surge? And so one of the biggest, biggest medications that's been studied that is used depending on where you work is called Esmolol, a beta blocker. So what does it do? It decreases sympathetic tone and antagonizes catecholamine surges, which in concept should start to calm down this electrical storm. So it's actually the only medication outside of the ACLS care in out-of-hospital cardiac arrest that has shown to increase survival to discharge with good neurologic outcome. It also has been shown and suggested to help make the heart more responsive to defibrillation. And again, that's more thought because it's blocking off this sympathetic tone. So there's two big studies that um, have really focused on Esmolol. So Driver et al. in 2014 used 25 patients with ventricular fibrillation that received three shocks, amiodarone, three milligrams of epinephrine. So now kind of per our definition earlier, these patients were in refractory VFib. So of those 25 patients, six got Esmolol, 19 did not. And between the two groups, there was a similar amount that had um, witnessed arrest and had VFib as the initial rhythm. 50% in the Esmolol group survived to discharge with a good neurologic outcome. And the other group that did not get Esmolol, only 10% survived. So that's pretty, so this study really recommended Esmolol's use. Then in 2016, Lee et al. did a pre and post study of including um, Esmolol into a treatment algorithm. So first they had an algorithm without Esmolol. And then they did another set time of the algorithm, including Esmolol. And again, they defined as previous, as driver et al. They used the same criteria. So three shocks, you got amiodarone, got epinephrine. And so here they found that the Esmolol group was more likely to get ROSC. So 53% got ROSC versus 16% in those that did not get Esmolol. But there was no difference in um, survival to discharge with good neurologic outcome. So again, this gets into a little bit of the epinephrine debate of, okay, I'm getting a pulse back, but what kind of meaningful pulse am I getting back? Um, and so in 2020, there was a big meta-analysis that gave some findings that Dr. Colgan, you want to review? Yeah, so uh, this was in January of 2020. This was Miraglia et al. Uh, they had a meta-analysis kind of to review the current literature. So these huge uh, studies that Dr. Georgiakakis is talking about from Driver and Lee had some really promising um, results, um, maybe not on neurologic outcome. But so they sat down uh, to try to kind of look at the literature overall and see, you know, kind of what do they say about Esmolol and refractory VFib. Essentially looking at over 2,800 articles on the topic of refractory VFib um, or articles that even kind of pertain to refractory VFib, they turned up two peer review articles that met their inclusion criteria for the topic parameters. Um, they found that in patients who received Esmolol, they did have more ROSC, but the, it did not meet statistical significance uh, in terms of neurologic outcome. Uh, they essentially concluded that, yes, the mechanism makes sense, that if people are in this kind of sympathetic storm, this electrical storm, it makes sense to calm the heart down before we try to do something else to um, get it out of this kind of this electrical storm. Uh, but essentially, the whole conclusion was that more primary research is needed. When I had first read this and kind of getting uh, into this topic of Esmolol, to me it makes physiologic sense for what we understand about is going on. Um, so I actually talked to our um, our team pharmacy and our emergency department who are some of the smartest people I've ever met. 
um, just about how we would actually practically dose um, Esmolol for this. Uh, most of the studies that even this meta-analysis looked at agree uh, on this dosing. Um, we just kind of wanted to put it out there for you guys. Um, they recommend giving a 500 microgram per kilo bolus uh, of Esmolol just right up front. Um, that's either putting it on a pump at a rapid bolus or you can almost do it as an IV push depending on uh, the volume. If it works, um, then you would expect to see a response. The problem with electrical storms is it's hard to kind of chill all those cardiomyocytes out entirely. So for refractory, refractory electrical storm or refractory VFib, they would recommend also starting uh, an infusion at 50 to 300 mics per kilo per minute. Uh, and that's just kind of the practical application of those mall. So do you use it in your practice? Absolutely. It just, it's the thing that makes the most sense. Giving more, uh, you know, alpha one and beta one, some pathomimetic um, adrenaline to this system just doesn't make sense for trying to calm down an electrical storm. Because I think the big thing that I keep thinking about is it really is this idea that if you have electrical storm and you're having depolarization and repolarization at random, what you really need to do is restore order to that myocardium, which the cardiomyocytes want to do. And so you need to give them some mechanism, not just speed up their action potentials. Totally. I completely agree. I'm always trying to minimize epinephrine in all our codes. And in these, in these situations, I absolutely use Esmolol too, because it makes so much sense. Mm -hmm. So one of the other interesting beta blockers that's been mentioned is propranolol. And so the reason for this was some of it is just a logistical concern with storage and administration, um, which we're always having to think about, unfortunately, in an ambulance. Um, but they found some animal data was suggestive first that it might be of some potential benefit. And so they found some early case reports in the 90s that described termination of refractory VFib with IV propranolol. So they were for a long time, ACLS was recommending propranolol one milligram per kilogram. And then they did um, a trial that basically compared ACLS that was lidocaine and then procainamide versus a sympathetic blockade, which in this case was propranolol, esmolol, or a ganglion block, which we're not even going to talk about. <laughs> um, and then compared, does the ACLS care, which didn't have sympathetic blockade, versus the sympathetic blockade group, which included propranolol, did it have any benefit? So they found in the ACLS group, um, four out of 22 survived and 18 died. And in the sympathetic blockade group, 21 out of 47 survived and six died. So that was kind of where the first thoughts were, huh, maybe this is useful. So in 2017, the AHA guidelines actually noted in patients with recent myocardial infarction who have VTAC or VFib storm, they recommend an IV beta blocker, which could be useful. And that's level 2A evidence, which is which is an interesting thought, um, especially in light of the fact that ACS, early onset beta blockers have actually been shown to potentially worsen mortality. So it's a slippery slope, but this is a very specific subset of patients we're talking about with very specific patho uh, pathophysiology. So kind of moving on, um, now we get into the antiarrhythmics. So instead of messing with the uh, catecholamine surge, now we're trying to see, can we just some sort of chemically cardiovert, so to speak, the, pa the patient's myocytes out of this. So really, when we talk about antiarrhythmics, we're talking about amiodarone, lidocaine, and procainamide. And we're going to touch more on amiodarone and procainamide, because those are the current medications still left to ACLS. They've really um, taken lidocaine out of favor. So why is amiodarone recommended? Without, without reinventing the wheel, again, I go into this in quite a bit of detail in the Cardiac Arrest podcast, but there's really two trials that have kept amiodarone relevant in cardiac arrest care. The first is the ARREST trial in 1999. So they randomized 500 patients. It was a double blind. So the patient, obviously, they're in cardiac arrest, and the provider didn't know what medication they were getting. And so they essentially either got 300 milligrams amiodarone IV or a placebo during out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. And they found in that study that the amiodarone group was more likely to achieve ROSC. In the ALIVE trial of 2002, they did 350 patients that was double-blinded. It was a clinical trial. Patients got three shocks, IV epinephrine, and then another shock or recurrent VFib that occurred after an initially sec successful shock. And now they did IV amiodarone versus IV lidocaine and who survived to be admitted. 
And so this was actually done when ACLS had allowed amiodarone and lidocaine and was now deciding which do we want to stick to because for those of you that have had to write protocols or learn protocols, having options is not good. <laughs> you want to just make it as clear cut as possible. So ACLS wanted to do the same. So they found that between the IV amiodarone, IV lidocaine, who survived to admission, so again, not to discharge, just who survived the ER, amiodarone had higher rates of survival to admission. So again, these two studies really have kept amiodarone on the cardiac arrest map. Um, there's further information in another podcast, but in 2016, another trial came out that was hoping to just answer this once and for all. So patients were in three treatment arms, amiodarone 300 milligrams, lidocaine 120 milligrams, or placebo. This was a randomized double-blind trial. It was non-traumatic out-of-hospital cardiac arrest that was refractory to shock VFib with at least one shock and access. So they looked at survival to hospital discharge, but then also looked at favorable neurologic outcome. This was a, um, a group of 3,026 patients. So about 980 were assigned to the amiodarone group, 990 to the lidocaine group and about a thousand to the placebo group so it was pretty evenly matched unlike some of the previous studies and they found that neither amiodarone or lidocaine significantly significantly increased survival or favorable neurologic outcome versus placebo so that kind of now raised the point of well do these even matter and i and i think what dr colgan said earlier kind of makes sense again this isn't about you know, this isn't like atrial fibrillation. This isn't just extra ectopic beats in a known place that we're just trying to quiet down. This is chaos that we are trying to tone down and completely reset. And that is really not what amiodarone or lidocaine is designed to do. So interesting idea. Is this enough to say, take it out of ACLS? I don't think so, unfortunately. Uh, but if you have further concerns, watch our other podcast because we continue to bash ACLS. So beyond amiodarone and lidocaine, the other big question, and I've been in favor of this as well, physiologically for a lot of reasons, is procainamide. So why procainamide? Well, it doesn't have a lot of the risks that certain other medications have, including some of the calcium channel blockers and beta blockers. So you know, one of the things you're always worried about in wide complex irregular tachycardia, for example, is is there some sort of reentrant tachycardia hidden? Is there a WPW? you give them a calcium channel blocker or something that shuts down the AV node and you've just worsened them and killed them. Procanamide does not do that. And it's very usable. It's very storable in an ambulance. The biggest concern is how you administer it. And so it's a weight-based dosing, 10, mic 10 milligrams per kilogram, but you're dosing to effect. And that's just a very hard route to do. For those of you that work in the field, even for those of you that work in an ER, you understand that this is a very difficult way to administer medicines, especially in an acute um, austere environment where it might just be you in the back. So that's really why procanamide has never been the front line, but it's a great drug. So in this setting, is it warranted? So there was a great study called the Procamio trial. So it was a head-to-head -head procanamide versus amiodarone. So 33 got this 10 milligram per kilogram dose of procanamide. 29 got amiodarone 5 milligrams per kilogram which is pretty much what that 300 milligrams in um, ACLS is essentially dosing. So the procanamide group had 9% of them had cardiac events, some sort of irregularity or arrhythmia. 67% terminated their VTAC or VFib. The amiodarone group, 40% had cardiac events, and only 38% terminated VFib or VTAC. So five times the adverse events, and, and then only half the termination in the amiodarone group. So this was really where people started going, huh, I wonder about procainamide. They then did one that was more dedicated just to the pre-hospital setting. And so this was, again, um, this was not against amiodarone. This was just a group in the pre-hospital setting got procainamide, a group did not. And it was 176 who got procainamide and about 500 who didn't. So again, that is a little bit uneven, but in the procainamide group, 45% survived to admission and 18% were discharged. In the patients without procainamide, 62% were admitted and 32% were discharged. So this in this study, the no procainamide group did much better. So 
I don't know that we have a set answer. I don't know. Do you use procainamide in the hospital? I do, especially for those. Um, there's always that question mark of the WPW underlying that kind of re-enter tachycardia or that AFib. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's there's also been a couple studies that have linked this to something like Brugada or re-entering tachycardia with refractory VFib, and they've shown that procainamide is a very reasonable um, kind of option. Again, the evidence is not fantastic, but like you say, physiologically, it makes a lot more sense, and it seems a lot safer than something that's going to block the AB node or calcium channel blocker. Sure. Good. Yeah, so unfortunately, the jury's out, but that's another thing to be talking to your pharmacist about, talk to your medical director about. You know, just depending what level of provider you are, it's just something to continue to think about and be watching the evidence because it makes sense. So, okay, that's kind of enough with the medication. So what are some of the other fun things we can do? So something I know most people have heard of is the dual sequence defibrillation. So when I was a fellow, it was really a big topic because there had just been some trials that had come out that said, hey, there's some really compelling data. So now the question became, how do we just maximize the benefit? So for those of you that don't know, I was gonna try and find a picture, but um, if you're in EMS, I hope you know how to defibrillate somebody. But if you don't, look at your local AED, there's a big map on how to do it. Uh, but essentially the, the common, you know, cardiologists and CVICUs aside, the common placement is the AL positions, the anterior and the lateral. And the point of that is that the vector of the electricity shocks through where the heart is supposed to sit. Now, um, this is the most common way we do it. And what's interesting is, you know, so this is the only math we're gonna say this whole time, but the equation that really matters when you're thinking about defibrillation is current equals energy over impedance. And so the current is what the defibrillator pushes through. And that is based on the impedance. And so the impedance is affected by many things, but the more impedance there is, again, it's the word impeding, it's impeding current flow. So it requires higher energy. So more impedance, like, like an obese person, there's more tissue before they reach the heart, it requires a higher energy level to get to a current, to get that current delivered. So the defibrillators often will measure impedance and try and increase the energy as they can. And that's why often if it didn't work, they have you increase your energy levels to try and account for that. Now, overall, we know that there are some simple ways that we can lower that imp impedance. Um, impedance, impedance, I don't know. Uh, you can clean the skin before. So if someone's super hairy, you know, the pads aren't completely on the chest, they're up a little bit. So if you can shave them, that gets it closer. Remove any sort of sweat, remove any sort of foreign body on the skin, mud, dirt, you know, snow, whatever. And then also increase pressure on the pads. You can see some people with towels push it down farther. The point is just minimize anything impeding, that way the current flow is better. So we know a heart needs 90% percent of the myocardium to be captured and the current has to exceed 14 amps. So we kind of know those things. So what we're trying to do here is make sure that any defibrillation is doing that. So when we get to dual sequence defibrillation, now the debate is, should we have two defibrillators working? Because when it doesn't work, the question is always, was there not enough energy delivered or was the vector wrong? You know, for those of you that have done an ultrasound on an echo, we know that every textbook, the heart is right here. But when you do real life echoes, the heart is here, it's like that, it's, it's all over the place. So our normal placement may not be effectively going through the best vector of the heart. So the thought has always been, we need to make sure that pad placement has maximal effect because they have done studies with ultrasounds to show that your pads are not going where the heart is. But we're obviously not doing ultrasounds on every patient. So the initial thought behind dual sequence was, well, let's improve the vector by adding vectors as well as adding energy. So the first people that did this is they would put two sets of pads on in slightly different positions. And that has since evolved into essentially, you, you keep your normal AL, anterior and lateral, but then you add an anterior posterior, and then they're attached to two different defibrillators. So then the two methods are, and this is what the big studies were when I was a fellow, was do we do it simultaneously or do we do them in sequence? Because the thought being, 
the, the big concerns being if we do it at the exact same time, if it's to the millisecond, the exact same time, there's a risk that the energy levels could damage both defibrillators. And then the other concern could be, well, that's a lot of current. The patient could get burned or something could happen. And so then they said, well, why don't we do sequential? And so there really has never been a good study to decide which is better. Um, but they've also done studies, even in the simultaneous, that have shown that no one does it simultaneously. Obviously, we're human. You know, by virtue of it, there's always some break in milliseconds. So that's kind of the story of dual sequence and why it's even thought to do anything. So you're doing two sets of pads because you're increasing, you're expanding the vector, and you're overcoming this electrical threshold that Dr. Colgan talked about, this electrical storm. You're giving more energy that gets over the hump of what's going on to hopefully reset the system. So early on, Ohio did this retrospective study of about 2,400 patients and found that 12 of those patients got dual sequence defibrillation. Of the 12, nine converted, so 75% of them converted, and two survived to discharge with great um, neurologic outcome, which is 2%. So 2% survived with good neurologic outcome, which is not great convincing evidence. London then did a similar study, and um, you have to keep in mind, for those of you that have listened to the podcast or read yourself the Paramedic 2 trial, the United Kingdom has a very different EMS system, so you have to keep that in mind. 45% or 45 patients got dual sequence defibrillation, 7% survived a discharge, which was the same as the standard defibrillation group. So again, these two retrospective studies did not show compelling evidence that this would be super helpful. Um, multiple studies since then have looked about doing it after the three to five standard shocks, and they found that survival was about 8%. And for those of you that know, in our country, our normal cardiac arrest survival is about seven to 14%. So doing this, according to these studies, was not really helping. So this great study came along called the dose vf rct and it was the first randomized control trial to talk about this and test this out and so the first thing though to keep in mind with this is this was a feasibility study so this was not a study like ones we've talked about that said those that get this did they survive better compared to others did they have good neurologic outcome this was just some feasibility things that measured those outcomes because obviously we care about them but they weren't powered that they could make any sort of definitive statements of significance about those outcomes. So they had three treatment arms. So they had about 39 patients and it was this big meta analysis and there were three treatment arms. There was the standard anterior lateral pads. They had another group that was just anterior posterior pads because one of the questions they wanted to answer was does if you just change the vector, which you would do by getting rid of these and just doing the front and back, that would only change the vector. It would be the same energy level. It would be the same everything. Does that change things? And that's kind of your initial comparison. Then your third treatment arm is dual sequence defibrillation. So the AL and the AP pads were on. And so they were assessing discharge with good neurologic outcome, which in all these studies is a CPC score less than two. So the CPC score is for post-cardiac arrest patients essentially their functionality, which is defined by a bunch of things, but four is essentially dead, and zero or one is us fully functioning. So two is pretty minimal. You know, you might have a little bit discoordination, something, but you still are independently performing your um, daily activities, all that kind of thing. Um, they also looked at adverse events, both to the patient as well as to the defibrillators, because as we talked about, that's one of the concerns is patient risks as well as equipment risks. And then the feasibility and impact of these various strategies on the quality of compressions, because this takes a lot of choreography with a bunch of um, defibrillators. So then they were saying, well, if people are messing around with this in the field, does that affect the most important thing, which is CPR quality? So ultimately, the good news was there were no adverse events in all 39 patients. So the defibrillator never malfunctioned. None of the patients had any burns, which kind of helps answer those questions of the theoretical concerns. The three groups had similar quality of rate and depth of compressions, and all of them still met the requirements of ACLS. So that kind of answers the logistical question. And while this isn't statistically significant, it's very important to note 
that 25% of these patients in the treatment arm of anything but standard, so 25% of the AP only and the dual sequence survived discharge with a very good neurologic outcome. So there's some important things here. So for one thing, they used various monitor types, Zoll and LifePak, which have different energy levels, different mechanics. They're a little bit different to actually set up and use. They also, this was supposed to be for rural and urban populations to be very generalizable, but far and away, I think over 80% were, were, were urban. So it really, I don't know what we can say about rural yet. They also excluded patients who were defibrillated prior to EMS arrival done by a fire department. So this could really underestimate the usefulness. Um, the other two things that this is more just as you evaluate your own systems, in this system, bystander CPR occurred in over 50% of the case. For us in Johnson County, Iowa, that is not where we are at. We are probably around 30%, but we're not to 50%. And the average time from call to shock is 11 minutes. And that's insane. I mean, we have to be on scene within eight minutes of a 911 call, but to then get there and have shocked in 11 minutes as the average is impressive. And so again, you know your system better. And I think that's really where the rural area is. That's a very unrealistic thought. But overall, this study is very encouraging and it says consider it. Um, that said, you know, did was there some of this mentioned in your meta analysis article too in terms of um kind of the logistical issues yeah not a whole lot um it was really kind of an over uh an overview of refractory vfib uh and the dual sequence defibrillation the the so the i don't have a lot to contribute to all the great you know studies that you've already been through um that I had found a Bell et al. Uh, review article that essentially had kind of had, it was a kind of a clinical key to refractory VFib. And when they talk about uh, the dual sequence or double sequence defibrillation, um, they really do, they just kind of recap that there's more energy and more vector through the defibrillation. Um, but what they found in their kind of review meta-analysis was that they really didn't have, you know, good evidence to support its, its use clinically. Um, mostly they felt that it was reasonable as a pre-hospital strategy because it's not very invasive. And as long as you're not kind of detracting from the already established principles of ACLS and, you know, you're not detracting from that care and you're not delaying things, and it's a very reasonable thing to try to kind of stop this, this electrical storm going on. Um, they don't really have any case control studies or um, really any studies to guide the appropriate use of it. Um, they just kind of recommended that it's something that's, it can be tried um, and it's reasonable, kind of like you say. Cool. Thanks. Well, we'll we'll talk a little bit more about the logistics of it too at the end here, but I want to spend a little bit of time here with the big kind of the big treatment here and this has caught a lot of attention recently and it's we'll talk a little bit more about it, but that will be ECMO and ECLS, so extracorporeal life support. So without getting too deep into the weeds, essentially, as we've talked about at the very beginning, the most common cause of this is coronary artery disease, and these patients can benefit from PCI or some sort of intervention by a cardiologist. However, as we've talked about, we're talking about EMS, so we are not readily near these places, and at certain shops like ours, they do not enjoy taking patients to the cath lab without a pulse, and so we have to find ways to get these patients to what they need, meanwhile they don't have a pulse. So one of the ways, one of the reasons that ECMO has been brought into this dialogue is ECMO can support cardiac function both before and after the PCI. So even if they've gotten their stent afterwards, they can then regain good uh, ventricular function, good neurologic function. But just by virtue of what it does, it's a great way for us to even get them to the cath lab and make the argument. So initially ECMO was actually used in pigs. And so that was where they decided, well, can we use what we've been using on surgery patients and uh, pediatric patients forever? Can we enter this into the cardiac arrest arena when we know that these are patients that need a stent, need a PCI, but we can't get them to the cath lab? In, and so what do we do in the interim? So essentially they took a bunch of pigs and they occluded all of their LADs, all their widow makers, and then resuscitated them for 45 minutes and then performed a cannulation after 45 minutes and 60, and then did, and then put them into the cath lab 
and they found that 60% achieved ROSC after the revascularization. So they found that after 45 minutes, where we would have all stopped resuscitating patients, they found that if they took into the cath lab after, when they'd been on ECMO, that they could get ROSC. So what does ECMO do? It has three goals. So it normalizes perfusion, it provides cardiopulmonary support to facilitate identification and treatment of the refractory VFib, in this case, you know, CAD and need for um, treating the occlusion. And then it's a bridge to recovery in the ICU. Like we said, it can be a great way to help patients regain their ventricular function and neurofunction. So Dr. Colgan, can you just kind of give a quick rundown of what ECMO is? Yeah, so, you know, ECMO, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, this is, um, this is high-speed medicine to be sure. So I, we, I need to find a way to put a picture up, but essentially what they're going to do and that what we're especially talking here for refractory VFib is what we call VA ECMO, that's venous arterial ECMO. Um, there is also VV ECMO, but for what we're talking about here for um, extracorporeal oxygenation and really resuscitation is VA ECMO. Uh, so what they do is cannulate uh, a major vein, usually a femoral vein, and then the contralateral femoral artery. The idea being that the vein and the artery are going to continue to serve their purposes. They are going to drain deoxygenated blood from the venous side, run it through an oxygenator and a circuit, and run it back in for the arterial side where it's now been oxygenated and it's going to circulate through the heart the entire cardiovascular system and come back out the other side deoxygenated again. Um, it's fairly straightforward, uh, very hard to do practically. Um, I want to kind of dive into the arrest trial now. Is that okay? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I th so I think the key to this is the reason we're doing this is if kind of take a step back, cause we've been talking a lot about, you know, all these treatments, like let's not forget these patients we're talking about. So this is a patient in cardiac arrest. You have arrived or you're in the ED waiting for this patient. And this is a patient that is in cardiac arrest with multiple rounds of shocks. They've gotten epinephrine, they've probably gotten amiodarone, and they are still in VFib. And again, we have to just assume by the numbers in terms of what we can fix that this is potentially a patient that's essentially having a lethal STEMI, so to speak, in the sense that they have some sort of coronary artery that's blocked off. So we know that STEMI patients go to the cath lab because they can ultimately get a stent and they can be revascularized so that that part of the heart that's dying gets blood flow. Now that's easy to do when we identify it, we get an interventional cardiologist to do it. These patients that need this as well are dead with CPR going on. So as we said, it can be very hard to convince a cath lab to take a dead person. So why is ECMO brought up? Well, by virtue of what it does that Dr. Colgan just said, it essentially takes the fact that they're in VFib out of the equation. Because what kills you in VFib is the heart is uncoordinated, so you're not pumping blood. So you're doing CPR to try and continue to pump that blood so all your organs continue to oxygenate and deliver and remove waste products. So if we just take that out of the equation and now have a machine do that for us, so it moves the blood, it circulates it, it oxygenates it, removes CO2, and then recirculates it, you now have time to get this intervention that treats the problem you've taken the fact that they're pulseless out of it because it's not that they're pulseless that's the problem, it's what it means that they're pulseless. Now you're doing the, you're doing the part that what their normal pulse would be doing for them. So that was kind of why we even have talked about ECMO and then they found that it can work in pigs. Europe is way ahead of us, I'm not gonna get into it, but in Paris, they are, doing, they are cannulating patients for ECMO in subway stations. That's one of the most famous pictures in EMS is setting up an ECMO cannulation site in the center of a subway. There's a mobile ICU unit that carries blood, it carries physicians, all kinds of things, and even has a mobile ECMO unit. But um, before we get to the arrest trial, there's just a couple other ones that led up to this because the arrest trial is the huge punchline. So the Save J trial in 2014 was a prospective observational study. So it was looking essentially at neuro outcome in these patients at one and six months. And so this was a treatment bundle. So it wasn't just ECMO. So it was, they had eCPR, which is what we're talking about here, where ECMO is essentially circulating. Instead of your compressions having to circulate, this machine is circulating. But they're also doing the targeted temperature management, so hypothermia, 
And then they had an intraaortic balloon pump, you know, to give some central um, hemodynamic support. Because again, you don't want to give pressors in these people because it's the same thing that Dr. Colgan was saying. Why introduce more adrenaline into a patient that that's not what they need? So this was essentially looking at a system versus, these were system level study. And so it was 26 hospitals capable of eCPR versus 20 that did not. And they found that the, the discharge with good neurologic outcome at one and six months was 13.7% in the eCPR hospitals and 1.9% in the non-eCPR hospitals. So the Save J trial in 2014 said, why aren't we using this modality in cardiac arrest? The CHEER trial, which is the first really famous study from Melbourne, Australia, was in 2014. They also had a treatment bundle. So they had eCPR, hypothermia, or sorry, mechanical CPR. So they were using Lucas devices on everybody, so it wasn't relying on people. Hypothermia, ECMO, and sending them to the cath lab for early reperfusion. So they had 11 that were transported and nine got ECMO. Of those nine, 45% survived with good neurologic outcome. So that number was astronomical compared to just normal cardiac arrest. And as we talked about in the beginning, in the past, refractory VFib was a 97% mortality rate. So the CHEER trial really opened the door for, hey, we really need to start evaluating this. So then Yiannopoulos et al. in 2017, did basically the same study, but in the US. So they had mechanical CPR, started a patient on ECMO and got them into the cath lab early. They found that 80%, 84% of the patients on ECMO got to the cath lab and in the cath lab were found to have a coronary artery occlusion, which kind of goes back to CAD being up to 80% of the cause of this. So of those patients on ECMO that went to the cath lab, 45% survived a discharge and 42% discharged with a good neurologic outcome. Again, 42% walked out of the hospital after being dead with a good neurologic outcome, which is, again, undeniable. And that study is important, and we'll allude, you know, we've talked about it, and we'll get to it here in a second. But that set the stage for the arrest trial, not to be confused with the other arrest trial that was about the medications with amiodarone. So in Japan, they did a study of just pure CPR, versus pure ECMO. And in the ECMO group, 12% had neurointact survival, 1% had survival in the non-ECMO group. Overall, that was worse than the CHEER and arrest trials. For those of you that also aren't familiar with a lot of EMS literature, a lot of it comes out of the UK, Australia, and Japan, just because of various reasons. But Japan has a very unique EMS system that is hard to ignore here. They have a tiered system, they have huge transport areas, and they have very few tertiary care centers. So it's hard to know what to do with those numbers. But um, I'll kind of get back to Pittsburgh because I think we've set the stage now for the arrest trial. So um, I'll let Dr. Colgan kind of get into the beginning, but the arrest trial is by the same people, um, Dr. Yiannopoulos et al. from 2017. They essentially, that was, an unofficial derivation study of, hey, could this work? And then they were able to do the ultimate arrest trial, which just was published and is, is causing a lot of buzz. So go ahead, just give us a quick rundown of the, the basics. Sure, so the arrest trial was just published in Lancet, um, but just very recently. Uh, this is kind of what is kind of the talk of the town right now, especially in terms of refractory VFib. Um, so the clinical question they were trying to answer was they wanted to compare the survival to hospital discharge between the standards of care in the community after arrival to the hospital. They were looked at those receiving typical ACLS resuscitation versus ECMO facilitated resuscitation. And I just want to take this opportunity to kind of reiterate that phrase, that kind of ECMO facilitated resuscitation. That really is what this is trying to get at. You know, this is refractory VFID that we're talking about is a pump problem. The pump has short circuited. And so the only way you're going to get around it is to literally bypass it and to fix the pump. Um, that's kind of what we're talking about here. So this was a phase two, <laughs> this is kind of a long thing, phase two single center open label pragmatic randomized controlled trial. Um, it used the exemption of informed consent under emergency circumstances as a primary means of enrollment um, and uh, kind of allowed for at least a small cohort of people with this rare disease to be studied. 
So the inclusions. So this looked at people who were 18 to 75 with the initial out of cardiac hospital rhythm being VFib or pulseless VTAC. They defined the treatment arm as people who had no ROSC after three shocks um, is what they had said uh, is their definition of refractory VFib. And they had to have a body habitus that allowed for placement of the Lucas device, the mechanical CPR to continue um, the pump or the heart kind of being its own pump for at least a little while. They also required that the transport time to an emergency department be less than 30 minutes. And that's because of these previous studies that showed that kind of the time to cannulation was kind of the big critical thing to especially good neurologic outcomes, but also ROSC. The exclusion criteria for the patients in this trial were fairly straightforward and kind of what you would expect. People with valid DNRs were not um, put on ECMO. Um, they excluded traumatic arrests, drowning, known overdoses, pregnancy prisoners. They, uh, they interestingly excluded nursing home residents. Um, and then obviously anybody with a opt-out bracelet um, from the community. And then anybody with absolute contraindications to emergent angiography, because that is always the goal of this. ECMO is not a treatment for refractory VFib. It is going to bypass the pump and try to get you to that PCI. It's, it's to convince the cardiologist that they don't need a 12 lead because they're in refractory VFib. So this is probably going to be a PCI amenable lesion. Uh, and so that's how you get the buy-in. They also said, uh, in kind of those absolute contraindications, sorry to digress, um, anybody with active hemorrhage, either known GI bleed or suspected internal bleeding, um, or, uh, so those are all the contraindications and the exclusion to people. And then they said that if uh, you had sustained ROSC within the first three shocks, then you were excluded because obviously they don't want to count that as refractory VFib. They, so what they did is they took these patients who met this criteria for, they were on either their fourth shock uh, and they were on their way to the hospital less than 30 minutes. And as they arrived, they had a study enrollment officer there um, to kind of randomize people to typical ACLS versus uh, ECMO facilitated resuscitation. Um, there was no blinding, obviously, to the ACLS versus ECMO arms of the people doing it because you can't uh, they cannulate people on ECMO. Uh, this study essentially found 36 patients in total. They had 14 in the treatment group and 14 and uh, 15 in the ACLS. Uh, that's mostly because one person actually ended up coming back and withdrawing from the study three days later. So um, that's kind of who we're talking about here. I'll let Pete kind of take it from there. Perfect. So that's great. Thank you. So survival to discharge. They made it through their cardiac arrest. They made it through the hospital admission. In the ECMO group, 43% survived to discharge, 7%, which is one person survived in the standard ACLS group. Now, what they did was essentially, so the only way they basically were able to do this is, you know, in these studies where they're testing a treatment, you have to have what's called clinical equipoise, which means you're not knowingly giving one group, one group isn't getting screwed, basically, you know, you can't give one group a treatment, knowingly giving the other group a more inferior treatment, you can only do it when either treatment has either not been proven to have a difference, a disparity, or any reasonable person would say as of now, they have an equal chance of working. So you have to build into these kinds of studies, some sort of um, threshold that you say, okay, in either direction, we have now made it clear that th we can't ethically continue because one is significantly better or worse than the other. There's a lot of um, stroke management trials that they've had to stop early because one group did significantly worse. And so they said, okay, that intervention, we have to stop. So in this phase, they did the same thing. They did what's called a posterior probability of superiority. And so they looked at the numbers and once they'd accumulated enough and had met a threshold, they would have to stop. So in this group, the ECMO group met that probability of superiority so far past that they had to stop the trial early because now there was no way of clinical equipoise continuing and they had just proven in their study that the ECMO group was getting a much better treatment and if they continued the ACLS treatment it was actually going to be you were potentially giving something now a knowingly inferior treatment which would violate ethics so they had to stop it early now they had some other things they wanted to look at they wanted to look at six-month survival and neurologic status 
Ironically, ECMO had a better six month survival because the only ACLS survival died at three months. And they had a Rankin score of five on discharge. And so just quick side note, as you remember, the Rankin score is up to six. Six is dead and one is us. So five is essentially, you know, probably heavy on, on ventilators and a lot of machines. And so already probably wasn't doing well, but then didn't survive to six months. So ECMO had better survival by virtue that it had survivors. And then they couldn't measure or compare neurologic status between the groups because no one in the ACLS group survived to that point. So of note, those that did die in the ACLS group, 13 from unsuccessful resuscitation, which is pretty standard. You know, I mean, I think that's, it's about 7% survival there. Um, two got ROSC and were admitted and then died. One died in the hospital just from anoxic brain injury, that kind of thing. So the ACLS patients, honestly, took, went down the normal trajectory that ACLS patients often go down. Um, but the key to this study is that, as Dr. Kogan alluded to, it only works with early implementation of ECMO but also understand that ECMO is a tool to get you to the treatment. So this is a highly orchestrated collaboration um, and you have to coordinate the chain of survival starting in the community, identify cardiac arrest, call 911. 911 has to get there and then very efficiently and quickly start very competent cardiac arrest care, which really to date, all the eCPR studies require mechanical CPR. Because while they're cannulating, they're going to require a Lucas device or the equivalent, you know, that's a proprietary one, but some sort of mechanical CPR in place. And they have to have ACLS meds and airway, all that kind of thing. Um, that said, it can't end there. The ED has to be ready. The ED has to have the next steps of requirement to hit the ground running, whether it's a new battery, a plug-in for the Lucas device or equivalent and a way to notify the cannulators and the cath lab and everybody that this patient's coming, then the ECMO cannulators need to be willing and ready, and then the cath lab needs to be ready. So there are multiple moving parts that are all parts in and of themselves that move very slowly. So now to move them all in tandem, everything has to, the stars have to align perfectly. And um, Time from 911 call to starting ECMO is the most important independent predictor of survival. So again, the faster they're identified, transported, and cannulated, the better. Um, one thing of note, though, these patients on ECMO, when they're discharged, they are highly debilitated and need a lot of physical therapy, occupational therapy. Because again, there are multiple things. They've been in cardiac arrest. They've been thumped on by a mechanical CPR machine for up to a couple hours. They've had a cath. They've since also been probably holed up with a, on a ventilator. You know, they're going to have deconditioning. They're going to have a lot of healing to do. They're going to have had this consistent catecholamine surge that can mess with their adrenals. It can mess with so many things that they have basically a lot of healing to do. But the key is getting the dialogue started early in your systems, talking to your medical directors, talking to your hospitals, talking to your departments, figuring out what are the obstacles to being able to offer this treatment to our patients when we are seeing that 40% can walk out of the hospital. So I doubt this is the last we've heard of the arrest trial. I'm betting this opens the door to a lot of further studies. Um, but it's an exciting time. There's some really cool stuff on the horizon here. We finally might have a way to get a leg up on this, on this um, cardiac arrest issue. But so that said, there's just a couple questions I just wanted to kind of throw around and then we'll, we'll cut this down just because I know it's getting kind of long. But um, one of the questions then coming forward is, you know, we have a great body of literature that on scene resuscitation is effective and the majority of patients that are going to get ROSC are going to get it in that 20 to 40 minute window on scene. And so because outside of that we start to consider termination of resuscitation. So understanding that staying on scene is improving outcomes according to recent li literature, but understanding there's patients here that need to get on ECMO to get to the cath lab in under 30 minutes, you know, what is that what's that line? When do we decide, what time interval do we decide, okay, we got to get moving? Um, and, and I don't think there's a set answer, but one study, you know, and then I want to hear your thoughts, 
Dr. Colgan, is Reynolds et al. kind of talks about this. And he says, amongst all eligible patients the of ECMO eligible patients, the probability of neurointact survival dropped less than 10% after 30 minutes of resuscitation. And there was virtually 100% mortality when it was over 40 minutes. Now, we've seen that. We know that. And that's why a lot of times most protocols um, really keep you on scene 30 minutes. And at, by 40 minutes, you're really calling medical control to terminate. So this study recommended starting to consider mobilizing between nine to 20 minutes of active resuscitation. Um, there's prior studies that agree that if they're under 65, if they're witnessed arrest, if you have CPR started in under 10 minutes from downtime, consider transport for eCPR between eight to 24 minutes. So pretty similar. And they found that sweet spot seems to be about 15, 16 minutes. Um, but I don't know, do you have any thoughts here? I mean, what, what's our threshold? When do we start thinking about it? You know, for me, I'm, I'm just a big fan of pit crew CPR. I think it just makes, you know, a lot of sense. And I think that practically speaking, if what we're trying to talk about is really making a difference in these refractory VFib patients, it makes sense to kind of incorporate it into the mechanism that's already in place. Um, you know, for me, if you're, you know, when I've run a code in the field and it comes down to, identification, early CPR, we're getting, um, you know, pads on the chest, monitors, IO access, not IV, we're not futzing around with stuff, we're putting a superglottic device. By the time that's done, it's time for a first pulse check. Great, shockable, shock back on the chest, then we're giving drugs, epi, amio. By the time it's, by the time the third shock would be, you know, it would be time for the third shock, you're pretty much on automatic pilot, it's, even if you're with with a two-person, you know, crew, if you're just a paramedic and EMT, or you're with a couple paramedics with maybe a supervisor to help, you know, you're pretty much on automatic pilot at that point. So if you're on automatic pilot, I think it makes sense to start talking, you know, let's package, let's get to the ambulance at the very least. But if you're already rolling by its time, uh, you know, that third shock is going, I think for, at least for our system, you're going to get to the hospital inside of 30 minutes by like a pretty decent margin. Then you can start talking about adding in other things like double sequence defibrillation if you want to try that on the way or when you get to the emergency department really quick, you start talking about being able to, able to add in things like esmolol in that kind of critical early period. And then you start talking about being able to mobilize the other resources, you know, ECMO, cath lab. So sure. to me, it makes sense that, you know, by that third shock, I just me personally, if it was my patient that I was managing that code, I'd want to be in the ambulance by the time we were hitting the hitting the shock button on that third fire. Yeah, no, I agree. I think I think especially in our system, that's true. And I, I think if you're identifying these potential patients, you've basically said there we know what they need to get to. So let's optimize them for transport. And I think you you can't effectively have identified them after one shock. I mean, that that initial definition is just crazy to me. But when you've gotten to the second one, you're continuing, you kind of see, you know, what, what the writing on the wall is, it might be time to start packaging. So I totally agree. But you said something that actually leads into my next question, which is where does dual sequence defibrillation kind of fit into our model? You know, I mean, I, is, is it, should it be built in? What's the protocol? You know, does, is it a black and white thing? And, you know, considering the kind of the time costs and logistics with each system, you know, what's, what would be the order of operations, I guess, for you in deciding how to do this? For me, I mean, based on everything we've talked about here tonight, you know, the biggest thing that we know makes a huge statistical difference is going to be getting to ECMO and a cath lab um, or doing something, something like Esmolol that's going to get them out of, you know, this, uh, this electrical storm for for double sequence and dual sequence defibrillation, I don't think there's a good, at least evidence-based answer for this. So I would say that it's gonna be nothing that kind of detracts from your ACLS care. I think in our system, you know, we have a supervisor, uh, like a paramedic supervisor that shows up um, that has another monitor, you know, so if they're on scene already and you're packaged and ready for that third shock, um, you know, in the rig, okay, give the third shock. And then maybe by the fourth, you try it. If you've got five minutes going to the hospital. Um, one thing I know that we've just kind of verbally kicked around is, you know, if the, if you have your whole chain of survival set up specifically for refractory BFib ahead of time, and you're, you've given your third shock, but now you're on your way to the hospital and the ER is ready for you. 
I think that's honestly, in my mind, that's the one that makes the most sense. Um, a paramedic crew can, you know, give a quick report and stick around ready for that, their own defibrillator to shock, as well as attach the emergency resuscitation defibrillator for a shock as well. Um, that's the one that just to me makes the most sense if you want to give it a try. I don't think the evidence is strong enough to say that that's something that absolutely has to be incorporated in that algorithm. I think more, something like Esmolol makes more sense, um, especially just, you know, physiologically. So that's kind of where I would fall. Cool. Yeah, I mean, I think even that dose VF trial, that was part of what they had to study. They had to choreograph it. They had to try all different. I listened to a podcast with the primary author, and he said we had to try so many different, you know, things to do it. And I, I think in our system, I agree. I mean, if, you know, if we're trying to get things sped up and we're now needing a supervisor to come meet us with another defibrillator, when, when it's something that's not proven benefit versus and is keeping us from the thing with proven benefit, it doesn't seem like it makes a lot of sense. And I just think about we often change out the pre-hospital Lucas device for the in-hospital Lucas device. So you're going to have a great view of that anterior chest to add a new pad. You know, there's not, it's not unreasonable to think you could find a time to roll and get that back one on. Um, yeah, no, I, I agree. Yeah. And that, that coordination of that dance of those literal physical movements of the patient and the team, it's not a small thing, you know, like it costs minutes when you start talking about that. I know I've seen a couple protocols from Canada where they, they have call in a second crew, like a whole second paramedic crew shows up with another defibrillator and they call after that third shock. I think if you have a system where, you know, you can't get to, you know, the kind of contraindications in the arrest trial, you know, you're more than 30 minutes away, you don't have access to PCI or you don't have access to an ECMO team, you know, then you could start talking about that kind of protocol where you have more resources mobilized to scene, somebody, you know, either a physician response or a supervisor response with Esmolol if it's not on your rig or, um, you know, another crew to help with a, another defibrillator, then that's more reasonable. But I think delaying a transport to what we know could help um, to get just another defibrillator doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah, no, I agree. And I, you almost wonder if they started working on this before arrest trial stuff really came up, you know, because I mean, when, when it was, hey, we, we stay on scene 20, 30 minutes to do this, and then we call it, you know, hey, let's try Esmolol. Hey, what else can we try before we're calling it? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. But good. I mean, so I'll, I was going to ask a different question and divert, but this kind of goes along with, with that, with the logistics is in general, in these models of these refractory VFib, where does the EMS physician fit in? I mean, you talked about the pit crew model. I too, obviously, for those that work with me or know me, I'm a huge proponent of the pit crew. And it, it takes a lot of training and it takes a lot of time, but you know, where is the EMS physician best suited in this system of care? Is it to go out and practically help with the resuscitation? Do they bring this other defibrillator? Or do they from the hospital bring procainamide, Esmolol? You know, are they the ones that come and identify ECMO candidates? Their systems where they might be the cannulator, like in France? You know, I mean, where, where do you kind of see an EMS physician fitting in here? I think it's really tricky because the European model is so different, you know, that they routinely incorporate EMS physicians into the regular care and it's kind of, you know, the, the paramedic crew is going to run the resuscitation while, you know, the EMS physician is cannulating or something similar. Um, I think in, in an American system, uh, the EMS physician is more of a supervisory role and coordinator is kind of what I see. I think the biggest thing that I certainly our system, but I think for any system that wants to try implementing something like this, it's going to really be, you know, the chain of survival has to be established way before the patient arrives there. You know, the ER has to be ready. You got to know, you know, the next steps that you're doing because everything else has already been done. You know, what this is, what the trip to the hospital is doing is facilitating ECMO and PCI. So I think identification of the appropriate patients, you know, this isn't the person found down who we don't know how long they were down questionable lividity, things like that, you know? Yeah. So I think the biggest thing that EMS physicians can do in our system is, is to help identify those ECMO candidates and really, and once you've identified it, carry it through, you know, really help convince the cardiologist and the ECMO team that this is that good person, you know, be that, um, be that ER, you know, I feel like as an emergency physician, we're often kind of arguing with other services to, you know, um, for our patients. And I think that's the best role for the EMS physician is really saying, nope, this is the time, you know, this was witnessed. They had hands on the chest right away. This is the good, this is the one that we need to be doing this for. Sure. 
No, I totally agree. You know, and, and that's actually, so Pittsburgh actually does a very similar thing that you're talking about. So the, the pre-hospital team's alerted, they go, they think maybe this is a, a possible candidate. So they call the EMS physician who has an eCPR checklist. And so they basically go through it and it at least gets the conversation started early on, like you said, and then the EMS physician can kind of take the baton while the pre-hospital crew continues to care. And it's asking very simple things, very similar to a rest trial. Was it witnessed? Is there bystander CPR? Are they 18 to 60? Do they have an initial shockable rhythm? Or PEA over 20, which I thought was interesting. Because I've always, I was always trained that PEA under 40 is functional asystole. So that was interesting. Um, do they have good functional neuro, neuro, neurologic you know, ability prior to the arrest? Like, do they live independently? They're not in a sniff. They have no neurocognitive issues. Do they have any irreversible organ damage? So COPD on HOMO2, cirrhosis, renal disease, terminal cancer. And then the, the logistical questions, can the Lucas device fit on them? Or the other interesting one that I wouldn't have thought of is do they have panis over their waistline such that they can't be cannulated? Or, or at least it would take more setup to be cannulated. I didn't really think of that. Um, they also have to have cabinography over 10 with CPR because studies have shown that you're not perfusing effectively. And then collapse to ED, only collapse to ED is less than 30 minutes. So, so in the Pittsburgh system, that is the EMS physician's job. They get contacted, they go through this list and early on can kind of scratch the patients that don't fit or at least then go, well, this one might. So then they can pre-alert your system. Hey, this is what's coming, that kind of thing. And it kind of, it goes into what you're talking about, which I think is great. And I think that kind of answers what was going to be my final question, which was, you know, how do we identify the patients who will receive the maximal benefit um, of on-scene care while also still retaining the benefit of their care escalation? And I think it's this. I think it's a system of care, um, the resources. I think the, uh, you know, your team makeup and your team buy-in. And it starts with community buy-in all the way up to your hospital administrators, your CMO. You've got to have support. You've got to have a good um, administrative support that's keeping track of the numbers. Um, One thing you said that I would just like to piggyback on is that idea of buy-in in in terms of something like a checklist for an EMS physician. You know, when when your specialty teams, the ECMO team and the cardiology PCI team have input on who, what kind of patients they want to self-select, you know, let them do it up front. Let them be involved in something like a checklist development and, you know, developing that program so that you know that you're checking the boxes that they want checked because then the buy-in happens way before, you know, you're making phone calls about a patient in the middle of the night. So I really like buy-in. Yeah. So just the only other thing, because it wouldn't be a cardiac arrest lecture if I didn't complain about epinephrine. We've already kind of talked about this and I won't get into it too much, but you know, I, I guess the question that has to be asked. And it's the question that the paramedic two trial did not answer for those of you that need help with that. Listen to my podcast is, is there going to be a time where we remove epinephrine from this algorithm of, ref, uh, you know, specifically refractory VFib because you talked about it. I mean, why are we adding adrenaline to a catecholamine surge to an electrical storm? It increases oxygen use. It increases cerebral and myocardial constriction. It's a dysrhythmic and can make refractory VFib much harder to break. So Lars W. Anderson et al. in um, 2016 tried to answer this. You know, um, So they did this observational prospective cohort. And so there was a group that had epinephrine within two, min- within two minutes of the first defibrillation. So basically standard ACLS. Um, and they did this propensity score matched analysis, which is a lot of statistical words, essentially. But Um, They were looking, they were trying to answer the question, does early administration of epi in cardiac arrest with shockable rhythms change things? And they looked at survival to discharge, ROSC rates, and survival to discharge with good neurologic outcome. So in 3,000 patients, 50% got epi in the first two minutes, just like you should in ACLS. Those that got epi in the first two minutes had associated decreased odds of survival, ROSC, and good neurologic outcome. So again, you add that to the paramedic two trial that showed is not getting them out of the hospital. It's getting them ROSC, but it's not getting them out of the hospital. In fact, they might have worse neurologic outcomes. You know, again, we, we don't have the necessarily the magic bullet to say, yes, stop using it. But again, just like we want to use Esmolol, physiologically, it makes sense. 
And I think there is a growing body of evidence to at least limit its use. Once you were getting into that threshold of we we're in refractory VFib, what benefit is epinephrine doing for you? It's it's tricky, honestly. I think it's, it's this research is just so hard to do. You know, this is a, a small percent of populations, and unfortunately, like these are patients that are dead already. So it's really hard to say that you know we're going to Lazarus everybody. But I think in this situation, like I kind of I almost wonder if you don't end up taking it a step further and say that eventually is epinephrine going to be out of the VFib pulseless VTAC algorithm altogether. You know, I think when you're talking about a, a heart with no electrical activity. Um, you know, when you're really talking about asystole, you know, I, I have a harder time arguing against something like epinephrine, sure. um, you know, like, sure, like, let's try to get something started. Uh, but when you have a heart that's in electrical storm, which is what VFib is regardless, you know, refractory VFib, it's really storming. But, you know, if you have a storming heart that's in ventricular fibrillation, it doesn't make sense to me to give a catecholamine. It does make more sense to kind of chill it out a little bit or shock it out, right? Because that's what matters the most in even just regular VFib is you get a big shock to reset this system that's going haywire. Sure. You're not trying to feed more power into the system. You know, it's just it, medicine is all, you know, physics and biochemistry. So yeah. if it doesn't make sense, it doesn't make sense to do it. Sure. Cool. Well, hey, we'll uh, we'll cut it short there because this has not been short, but it's been a really good discussion, really exciting, and uh, just want to thank you for coming on and sharing what you know and what you're learning and um, just contributing to this discussion that I think is a lot of what we're going to be talking about when you're long gone with fellowship. It's going to be decisions we're both making in our respective jobs, and it's it's cool to see what's on the horizon. So thanks. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. Looking forward yeah. to coming. Yep.